Oh, that's what I wanted to tell you before we started recording. Um, Kel's pregnant. Because, no, you were getting a lot of high-end rattle in the last episode. I was wondering maybe if it's from your microphone being on the table there. Like, I didn't know if maybe there should be, like, something underneath it, like a magazine or something that'll kind of kill some bounce back. That's a something. How to clear your homes of ghosts and spirits. You just have to make sure it's the right size. When a girl says it's a nice size... It means she really likes you. Or she just wants the night to end in a hurry. Uh, I have two legs on the book. Okay. Wait, we'll see how that goes. That came... We're getting wow. That I got that when I ordered my ordainment certificate, by the way. You're welcome. Like it just came with it, or...? It was like an add-on. But it's one I hadn't seen before, so I rolled with it. <laughs> an add-on, like, kick-started your ordainment? <laughs> yep. Pretty much. <laughs> Welcome to a Blues and Spirits podcast! It's bacon! It's like a drink with death. A no. Bacony drink with death. Well, now I feel bad I didn't prepare a bacony cocktail. It's lucky episode 13. I didn't even consider that when we were trying to figure out what to do with this episode. Well, we fucked that right in the <laughs> right in the ear hole, didn't we? <laughs> uh, we've been pretty good at screwing the pooch lately. So lately? Might as well keep up. By keep lately, up the, uh... we mean uh, since we started. <laughs> cool, though. I see you're wearing a default drinkware shirt. I am. I am wearing a default drinkware shirt from T Public slash Booze and Spirits or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> some, some URL similar to that. I did just post up the uh, Lemon Peel Ghost today. Mom bought a Nat yelling at the ghost shirt. Yeah. And it showed up with some other shirts and has gone MIA. The borrowers have taken it, apparently. Didn't a shirt get purchased for Nat, too? I don't know. Oh, I thought you determined that. One was going to be. I don't know if it oh, okay. I was just curious, because according to the site, we've sold three of those shirts, and I bought two of them, so... <laughs> I mom bought the other one, so I need to buy one for Nat, probably. Well, on top of today, we are talking about celebrity ghosts, I mean, because... I mean, Nat's kind of a celebrity. She's got her own t-shirt, She's got so. her own t-shirt. I've seen her punch <laughs> people in the baby makers and get away with it. I feel like that's, <laughs> if anything, is. Uh, oh, I'm talking too low. La, 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 okay. Kind of worried about that when you start moving your mic, too. I was like, oh, it's way, way. I have to have mine right up in my face. I really considered buying a really nice mic and, like, some sound deadening panels before we recorded today. But then you remember thought, you met your, you've met your kids? <sighs> no. Well, there was a little bit of that, but mostly it was just like I was convincing myself, no. You've got the sound quality to be halfway decent before. I'm sure that you can do it again if you just figure out what you're doing, but I could be totally wrong on that. Oh, yeah. So, uh, completely unrelated, but something that just came to my attention as, like, my little baby hairs are falling out of my messy mom bun. I was like, that's not normal. And then I remembered I had to cut a chunk of my hair out yesterday to get it off. Like, I wore a dress to work that just had one button at the base of the neck. Oh, no. And there was no getting out of that. The hair was so <laughs> aggressively wrapped around it. I was just like, ah, balls. Very, that's very Victorian or Edwardian of you to have to cut yourself out of your dress at the end of the night. Not the first time, won't be the last time. <laughs> I've been sewn into dresses for more than one occasion. Okay. God, my life used to be interesting. Can we get, like, can more people get vaccinated just so I can go back to leading an interesting life? Right. Jesus Christ, like, I'm starting to run out of story. Exactly. Like, I have very few <laughs> shenanigans up my sleeve still. So I'm telling you, we're going to make our own, we're going to start our own Grand Tour style series where we just go places and upset everyone who lives there. Bad Decision Club. TV. <laughs> um, I mean, oh, ow, I just found a very noisy baby toy with my toe. <laughs> I feel like Sean would be down to participate in that. So, you know. I ran it by Kel. She's not totally opposed, but I think she's, you know, hesitant. <laughs> well, you know, we know who has the, the more fun partner. She's well aware that she would be our James oh. Lee, so that's part of the situation. Hard Durbin. Hard Durbin. All right, well. Bigfoot in your house? I don't think so. Oh, 
I don't think he'd fit in our ceiling. <laughs> All right. It's a booze and spirit. We're going to talk about some, some spirits and some spirits. Some gin and some gin. No, we're talking about uh, celebrities and ghosts, because I looked at our metrics and our two most popular episodes by far are Lizzo and the giant otter and the one about the warrants. So I just assumed that our listeners just want to hear star about fuckers. celebrities. They're star fuckers. They're all star fuckers. Yeah, they're all star fuckers. That's what I decided. It's fair. So, did you get a good celebrity beverage ghost? Well, I mean, I did like ponder through, I'm not going to lie. I spend a lot of time with a child pending me down. So I've watched a few episodes of uh, Celebrity Ghost Story on Amazon Prime. <laughs> I did enjoy some of those stories. One was from uh, Cassandra Peterson, yeah. aka Elvira, which I just liked because it was Elvira. But I didn't roll with that one. I did like a story from Brett Butler. But, you know, I'm not sure a lot of people know who Brett Butler is anymore. Yeah, she's not as much of a household name as she might have been in the 90s. But uh, <laughs> she had a ghost in her house that essentially, like, defended her from her abusive husband in her early life. Well, that sounds so good. Um, that's not got, the story got, I'm doing, but I'm like, good for that right. fucking ghost. Well, I got two stories, so I should probably you should start. hit one of mine first yeah. so we can bookend it here. Um, so, this is the story of Paramount Joe and Billy Ray Cyrus. Paramount Joe? Is that like Joe Exotic? Possibly, I don't really know. Different. In the 1940s, they were renovating the Paramount Theater in uh, Ashland, Kentucky, and there was four construction workers on loan from Cincinnati's Boyd Theater Company that were there working in the auditorium. Three of the men went off for a lunch break, and the other one, Joe, decided to stay behind to keep working. When the men returned, they were kind of shocked to find Joe dead hanging from the rigging. I couldn't find any information if that was like a... Suicide, or, or if it was an accident? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't figure that part out. The yada yada is since, that. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Ever since then, though, Joe has become a regular part of the Paramount Theater. The staff has nicknamed him Paramount Joe, and he's featured in a lot of their branding, even. If you go to the website, like, there's, like, a Paramount Joe Cafe, and Here's a Paramount Joe Paramount stage. Joe? Like, Met him a long time ago. <laughs> no, no, different. Where did you come from? Where did you go? How did you get up on the rafters, Paramount Joe? So, Joe knows all the normal theater ghost tricks. You and I are theater people. We know all the theater ghost shenanigans. He makes sounds. He'll tap school children on the shoulder. He'll take objects, create cold drafts. Uh, occasionally, he's even seen briefly by the odd witness, usually in workman's overalls. Many people have reported looking out into the audience and see to see him out there, only for him to disappear again in a blink. Joe has shown himself to be particularly protective of the theater. A former marketing director was quoted in saying, it would be interesting to see if someone meant harm to the theater in some way, how he would act towards that person. <laughs> so, I mean, it almost sounds like a dare, like, hey, come fuck with our theater and see what Joe does to you. <laughs> Can we send Zach Baggins? Oh, maybe. Can we, uh, my brain was like, if we could rig it up like Home Alone, and then Paramount Joe could be Macaulay Culkin. And anyway, uh, when Billy Ray Cyrus came to the Paramount, he shot the video for Inky Breaky Heart there. Uh, he became, yeah, he became entranced by the legend of Paramount Joe. Billy Ray loved the story so much, he began talking to Joe regularly, joking with him or asking for his help during shooting breaks. Nice. Yeah. Well, and, and after the shoot was over, Billy Ray autographed several posters for members of the staff with personal inscriptions, including one for Paramount Joe. You know what? I just I just got a lot more respect for Billy Ray. Right? <laughs> like, I never so, really had anything against him. The mullet I had, you know, some opinions on. But, uh, yeah, now I think I like <laughs> Billy Ray. So, the theater, like a lot of theaters, it has a, a wall dedicated to signed photos from the acts that come through. And the posters that he signed all found themselves a home on the wall, uh, including Joe's. Over time, though, the wall began to fill up and room needed to be made. And since there were so many of the same posters that just had personal inscriptions on them, they, it was decided that some of those posters needed to go. But no one wanted to give up their own inscribed poster, so they decided to remove Joe's instead. Dumb. That is a rookie mistake, <laughs> guys. Rookie mistake. Rookie mistake. Like offering up your urine to... Calm down the fairies or something. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe if you're pregnant, the hormones in the urine will attract bears. Sedate fairies or, you know, 
get them all excited about a baby to steal it. Oh. Part of me wants to look into that. Part of me just wants to make shit up about it as I go. That's Guess what lane I'm in right now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they pulled down Joe's poster. The next day, they found the wall of photos had been completely cleared off. Every single picture had been knocked off the wall. Several of the frames were broken and shattered from having hit the ground. Fair. <laughs> yeah, so... Realizing they had upset Joe, they cleaned up the mess and then found a special place for Joe's poster to be hung in the display of the Marquee Room, which is now a part of Paramount Joe's Rising Star Cafe. Like I said, they got lost up there named after him. So the postscript to this is years later, Billy Ray Cyrus returns to the Paramount to perform a show, and all of the sound died mid-show for a good five seconds. And Bailey Ray just laughed and said, good to see you too, Joe. I mean, I get that. I used to yell hello to the ghost at the restaurant when they'd start acting up. You know, I've spent so much time alone in theaters because I did a lot of light rigging and I'd be in there by myself in mostly dark. I just kind of got used to theater ghosts being around. <laughs> yeah. You see weird dots of light move across the stage like, all right, guys, I'm, I'm working here. Yeah. I mean, that was a pretty common occurrence and. Most of the designated theaters I've been in, the spaces that are used, like that have a stage that are used for other things, also I don't feel like have the same sort of rigmarole. But like what other things? Like the like, rehearsal, like music, or like the rehearsal oh. space at DHS and things like that. Like those don't have Comedy. that same like. It's got yeah. a theater ghost. Well. This is a sideline. My concept on a theater ghost is always that ghosts and spirits are looking for a good bank of emotional energy to feed on. And if you go to a theater, you got you got actors going out there forcing emotions out of themselves, and you have the audience reacting to those emotions and getting emotional themselves. So it's just kind of like a, an emotional blood bank that you can draw and deposit at will. Yeah, no, I would I would definitely agree with that. There's a lot going on there. And the people that have put their time and energy into that theater are also going to be very emotionally vested in that space. Yeah, that's true. So look at us being all philosophical and not just I know, right? Feet. Sorry, I'll get I'll get back on track. <laughs> oh, I had a long day. <laughs> I don't know what day it is ever, basically at this point in my life. A miserable day. It's a miserable day. It's sunny uh -huh. here. I'm a little no. sad, though, because Sean took the baby to the gym to go in the pool so I could record, and I haven't been with the baby to go to the pool. It's his first time. I'm a little sad. Oh, the pool. No, the pool's here open. Yeah. You don't want to go in the warm pool. I feel like that's not your jam. It's like 95 degrees or something. It's, I mean, it's okay. They have one of those at the Aqua Center here. You're like, I'll tolerate it. It's an open pool. I've been meaning to look up. I'm fairly certain that living in Washington, I'm living in the only state where I'm not yet eligible for the vaccine, which is kind of frustrating. Um, you wouldn't be eligible in Oregon yet, either. Uh, Soon? I think, like, in the next month or so? But they also... I'm, I'm supposed to be eligible Thursday. I'm supposed to be eligible 15th, is what they said, but we'll see. Well, they said that frontline workers, like restaurants, grocery store employees, that sort of thing, were going to be eligible, like, the 15th or so here, but then they ended up doing it on the 5th, and they didn't really announce it. I don't know. Washington claimed all adults over 16 on the 15th, but we'll see. They'll probably change their mind because King and some Homish counties can't get their shit together. I have a celebrity ghost story. Um, someone who's had a lot of injections. Oh. <laughs> That's half of Hollywood at this point. So, I'm talking about Joan Rivers. Ah, Joan. I love Joan. God bless Joan. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Joan Rivers. There is... Jim Norton has a joke about how much he loved Joan Rivers that he would still eat her pussy 48 hours after she died or something like that. <laughs> well, I kind of wish this is video podcast now with that reaction. <laughs> I, 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 I just, yeah. Is that a joke? I don't even know. I don't, I'm just, I feel, I feel like, I don't even know. I don't even know. All right. So, uh. Joan Rivers actually appeared on the very first episode of Celebrity Ghost Stories in 2009, mm. and she talked about her haunted apartment building. So Joan was never really a big believer. She did, but she's, you know, she's an emotional lady. She's been through a lot, and mm. she died in, like, 2014. So I'm going to do my best to not talk about her like she's still alive. Really <laughs> hoping she's just one of my lingering spirit guides, though. Anyway... 
She thought ghosts and psychics and everything were silly. She had a really bad year. She'd been fired. This, so this is the late 80s. I want to say 87-ish. She'd been fired from her late night talk show. Her husband had committed suicide, which she had a really hard time coping with. Like, she almost committed suicide as a response to that. She was out of money. She'd made bad investments. Everything was going wrong in her life. So she decided to go back to New York, leave L.A., She went to look at apartments in New York. She went into an apartment that was for sale on the top floor of a big old stone building. It had been a ballroom, and no one had ever even attempted to purchase it to convert it into anything else. So it was still essentially just this, like, broken-down ballroom. I think it was the seventh floor of a building. That was the top floor. So this building, I think, was built turn-of-the-century-ish. She was putting all of her energy and all of her money into this apartment. She did have a lot of workmen there, so she would go at night when they weren't there just to walk around and be excited. And one night she was headed home and she decided just to stop by and check out the apartment. She had her, like, Yorkie with her in the car, and they got up to the door of the apartment and the dog wouldn't go in. And then she got inside, and it was August in New York City. It was hot. The apartment was freezing cold, and she saw, like, weird writing and markings on all of the walls around her. Was this was this the building from Ghostbusters? <laughs> I could not confirm nor deny. Okay. But her dog was just, like, carrying on, going crazy at the door, and she was confused. So she did her thing, decided to leave, got back to the elevator, and told the elevator guy, my apartment's so cold and the dog won't go in. It looks like somebody was in there writing on the walls. And... He said, oh, I guess Mrs. Spencer is back. She's like, say what? So she asked him what he was talking about. The building was originally Mrs. Spencer's home. She was a niece of J.P. Morgan, and she'd lived there for her whole life. As she was getting older, she would move further and further upstairs and then rent out the lower floors. And then she ended up living in the ballroom for the end of her life, and she had died there about, I think, seven years before Joan moved in. And the guy told her, she comes back, and she just does things to people in the house. So she found out, like, one neighbor in the building had an amazing antique chandelier. It had cherubs on it that held all the light bulbs. And she came home one night, walked in, and every cherub's head was broken off the chandelier. There was, like, cold spots, cold apartments that, like, It moved. It was never traceable. One day somebody's apartment would just be cold. And she didn't know what to do. She's freaking out. She's a new widow. She's put, like, all the money she has left into this, trying to, like, make it her sanctuary. She called the New York University Parapsychology Department. My apartment is haunted. I don't know what to do. told you this was Ghostbusters. It's an Ivo Shandor building. And uh, they were like, oh, sorry, we don't do that. And she, Joan Rivers them and harassed them (laughs) because she didn't know, like, have any idea what to do with this apartment. And whoever she talked to, the parapsychology department was like, we shouldn't tell you this, but in New Orleans, there's this woman who's a voodoo priestess and maybe she can help you. So they gave her this voodoo priestess information. So she called her and told her everything, crying. The voodoo priestess is like, I'm coming to help you. So the voodoo priestess comes to New York and conducts a ceremony in the apartment. Joan said it was something like out of a bad movie, chanting and talking and drumming. Uh Ghostbusters is a good movie. That's not a bad movie. (laughs) When did Ghostbusters come out? The timeline might not add up here for... 85. uh, (laughs) Or is it 85? I came out in 85. I know you came out in 85. I think you came out in 85. We'll fact check that, maybe. We remember. (laughs) Probably not. Anywho, the voodoo priestess said that Mrs. Spencer was very angry. She was still the grand dame of that building and didn't like what was being done to the house, her home, and who are all these people. And it just kept going on. And for about an hour and a half, this ceremony is going on. And then all of a sudden, the voodoo priestess screams, gasps, and says, She's gone. Joan said her apartment warmed up immediately. Her dog that had been waiting outside of the door came in for the first time in five months without calling. So it's like just a total energy shift. It was about 2.30 in the morning, and the voodoo priestess said, let's go to the other apartments and see if they want help. (laughs) So 2.30 in the morning, they go to all of the doors, ringing doorbells, and saying, hi, it's Joan Rivers. I'm cleaning out my apartment because Mrs. Spencer was in my apartment. This is my friend from New Orleans. She can help you too if you'd like. (laughs) Joan said not one person slammed their door. Everyone had a story. And that's where Halloween got started. (laughs) Trick or treat. Yay! One of the people said she'd seen a couple coming down the staircase in a full 
evening dress, or not a couple in an evening dress. That'd be tricky. A couple in full evening dress, like they were both in evening attire. She said, good evening. They walked out. She asked the doorman, who was that? And the doorman said, who was who? Yeah. One of the women had looked at the that Jones apartment before she bought in the building, thinking of buying it. And when she walked in, there were couples dancing in full evening dress. She thought someone had rented it for the night. And she went back to the real estate agent or whoever, and she was like, oh, there are people in there dancing. She was like, no one should be in there. And they went back in there, and there was nobody there. Joan moved in, and then, like, the energy started shifting again. The dog started getting really antsy in the apartment. It started getting cold again. Her electronics started having issues so she realized that like Mrs. Spencer had returned she'd say Mrs. Spencer I'm a widow all my money's in this apartment you cannot do this to me you must must leave me alone and it just kept happening but then one night Joan was down in the basement with the handyman and they found a portrait like shoved behind the drywall and broken bricks and Joan took it out and went this is Mrs. Spencer so she took the portrait and she had it cleaned up and restored and then she hung it in the lobby of the building also the doorman that had been there for years confirmed that the portrait was of Mrs. Spencer but after she hung it up in the lobby she got a phone call from the voodoo priestess she's told her I've had a visit from Mrs. Spencer she's very pleased that you put her back into her home and she's very happy with what you've done to the ballroom and she likes that you keep flowers there. So it had been 18 years at the time of this story that Joan had been in that property and she kept putting flowers out for Mrs. Spencer. She says that almost every night she feels Mrs. Spencer come in to her room between 3 or 4 in the morning. The dog wakes her up. She'll feel a presence and she'll just say, hello, Mrs. Spencer. And that's just their, like, was their day-to-day -day interaction, night-to-night -night interaction. I do think... I think that Joan ended up buying two more floors of that building, but when she died, I think like a Saudi Arabian man bought the apartments and completely gutted them. So I don't know what Mrs. Spencer's doing now. I'm a little sad for her. She might be she might be terrorizing a sheik. I don't know. She could be. Let's not downplay the fact that you could be sitting in your apartment and one day there's a knock at the door and it's like, hi, I'm Joan Rivers and this is my voodoo priestess. We'd like to clean your home. Oh my God, please. that would be like a dream come true. Like that would be like me getting up at 2.30 <laughs> in the morning and answer the door and not being mad. <laughs> uh, all right, well, that's fun. So I do have one more story. We decided on the last episode that we were going to do celebrities and then Almost immediately after that, I was online and I saw that uh, Alex Matsuo, she is a paranormal researcher and investigator. She's got an article in The Feminine Macabre. She had just published an article about Britney Spears and Britney Murphy. So the house that Britney Murphy died in used to belong to Britney Spears and Britney Spears thought it was haunted. I didn't know that. I know that, like, Brittany Murphy died under some very mysterious circumstances yeah. that were ruled an I'll get, accident. I'll, I'll get into, I'll get into, okay. I got all that stuff here, because because I wasn't aware of all that stuff. Like, I remember when Brittany Murphy died, like, I paid very little attention to it, because at the time, Hollywood and Peter is kind of a drug-addled party girl, so I just like, ah, oh, well, that makes sense. I didn't even know what the cause of death was. I just assumed she fucked around and OD'd or something. But if we go back to Brittany, I believe that Brittany owned this house when she was living with Justin Timberlake. And a former stylist employed by, by Britney Spears claimed that one night or one day Brittany employed a Reiki specialist for relaxation. And that the Reiki specialist <laughs> accidentally opened a portal while they were doing energy work. So they believed that two spirits, one male and one female, had come through the portal. And they almost immediately made things horrible for Brittany there. They fought with each other constantly. And one time they even tried to push Brittany down the stairs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the whole thing terrified Brittany so much that she moved into a hotel and just sold the house without ever returning. But the person who purchased it from her was Brittany Murphy. Now, if we go to Brittany Murphy and her story, she died in December 2009. The cause of death was determined to be socially contracted pneumonia with intoxication and iron deficiency from anemia being contributing factors. And at the time, her anemia was blamed on she was supposedly having multiple and very heavy periods. Between that and, and all the pharmaceuticals in her system, which were all, they were all prescription or over-the-counter. There was nothing illegal in her system. 
but from all those, like, she wasn't able to fend off the pneumonia was the theory. Yeah, I mean, like, Michael Jackson died from prescriptions that were prescribed to him. Like, yeah. it's, it's, that's a, you know, she wasn't doing anything illegal, but... Well, it, an investigation... Questionable. Investigation Discovery did a kind of mini documentary about her death, and I guess, like, HBO Max has another one coming up soon that's on the same subject. Yeah. But, well, because her husband died, like, her weird, creepy husband died like basically the same way like six months later okay, well, here's, the, here's the thing though about first of all when they when they got there they found out that he had like 90 different prescriptions all in his name <laughs> and, yeah which was weird um but yeah he was and i don't know if he actually was creepy like that's kind of how they painted it in this documentary i saw but the investigation discovery documentary but also they were really sensationalizing stuff that didn't need to be sensationalized like so that's that's true, but he was like older and on a lot of pills and like he was, not very he attractive was, and he kind was of 30, He was thirty nine and she was thirty two. That's not a... okay. Like <laughs> based on his appearance, I thought he was like forty five. That's fair, but he was only thirty nine. That was he was he was not um, that attractive, and I don't know. If there's I, I won't say that. That's inappropriate. What you're saying is that skinny cute girls can't be with fat ugly guys. Is what you're saying, right? <laughs> no, that was not what I was going to say. I was going to say there's two kinds of British guys, hot ones and creepy ones. <laughs> anyway, like you said, yeah, her husband was found dead five months later in the home. They do their uh, post-mortem, and sure enough, his cause of death was also pneumonia and with iron-deficient anemia being a contributing factor and. Because of his heavy period. Well, see, that's just it, though. We know he wasn't having a period, so what the fuck happened there? He had external causes, like he suffered from epilepsy and sleep apnea, and there was also some reports that he um, had occasional bouts of asthma. A common theory was that the home had black mold, but apparently Simon, her husband, had the home checked for mold in October before she died, and neither of their autopsies showed any evidence of mold in their system. There is the curiosity that Brittany, Simon, and Brittany's mom, Sharon, all had recently got an illness in Puerto Rico. And Simon and Sharon apparently were self-medicating from Simon's never-ending pillbox to uh, fight it off. And they, they never came out and said it directly, but I got the impression that maybe they were encouraging Brittany to do the same because they did note that she never went to go see a doctor about it. Brittany's father, which she was an interesting character, he was like a... Uh, <laughs> a mob man from Florida that <laughs> ran nightclubs. Wasn't clubs. in her life a whole lot yet. Yeah, no, no, no. Laundered money for the mob and ran nightclubs. Anyway, he suspected foul play and was pushing for a hair examination, which the medical examiner hadn't performed in the initial autopsy. He fought and fought and fought, and eventually they relented and dug her up and did a hair sample. The hair showed 10 different heavy metals present, so her father believed that was a sign of arsenic poisoning which you can go into that into the documentary. It's on Discovery Plus if you want to look into that. But his idea was that they poisoned Brittany for her money and then Brittany's mom poisoned Simon for the money. And I don't know, none of that made any sense to me. It just seemed a convoluted way to, to get to the money that Brittany was freely giving her mother to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> so it was well reported that Brittany, the only place in the house she ever felt comfortable was the master bathroom. And I can't remember, I thought maybe that I looked at several articles, so I kind of lost some of my details. I think they said Britney Spears kind of reacted the same way, was that the, the master bathroom was the only one she was comfortable in. Brittany Murphy, family friends, claimed that she would hang out there obsessively trying out cosmetics and perfumes, which her mother denied. But also in that Investigation Discovery documentary, they have video footage of her bathroom, and it is just every flat surface is covered in cosmetics. I saw at least a half dozen of those, like, plastic Tupperware, four, three or four drawer cabinets stuffed around the room that were all jam-packed to the brim. So I'm thinking she had a cosmetic issue. Um, <laughs> she, she apparently was trying out the cosmetics. Now, the, the reason that's interesting is because I said, you know, they're trying to talk about arsenic poisoning. Hair dye, especially in heavy usage, is a contributing factor to finding heavy metal deposits in the hair root. So, well, I mean, that would make sense, because there, yeah. there's all sorts of terrible things in that stuff. Yeah. I really need to get the roots done, by the way. <laughs> the actual house itself 
has been torn down and the lot's been rebuilt on, so that house itself does not exist anymore. But the lot has reportedly changed hands ten times since 2010. Oh, that's a, that seems excessive, Yeah, and, even by Hollywood standards. Well, when I looked it up, I, it took me a while to dig these up, but I was able to dig up that the median year of residence for current West Hollywood residents, the median year that they moved in is between 2008 and 2011. So most of those people have been there for that 10, 11 years, but, yeah. but this property just keeps changing hands. So that was that was all interesting. One other thing of note that uh, Alex put in her article, and I'll I'll link that because it was it was what got me started down this rabbit hole that suddenly became an afternoon obsession. Uh, yeah, now I'm very interested in this rabbit hole. <laughs> researcher Johnny L. Tinney believes that perhaps the two ghosts that entered through the portal that Britney Spears opened were actually Britt and Simon from the future. Hmm. Hmm. So that's a. An interesting little saga there, which, like I said, HBO's doing another, I think, two-part documentary on the subject. I don't know if there's much more to suss out without getting all over-the-top scandalous about it. But Do you like an over-the-top scandal? <laughs> so, I mean, there is still some peculiarities there. Like, I guess you could have gotten pneumonia in Puerto Rico with everyone else. And... Maybe she was patient zero of COVID. No, oh, maybe. <laughs> But she didn't go see a doctor. It sounds like she was encouraged not to go see a doctor by her family. So, which I mean, like that were like I'm not surprised, but that's also so worrisome because like you look at young Brittany Murphy and she like I'm not even talking about like the skinniness, but just like the look around in and around her face and eyes, like you can tell there's like some health issues going on there. Yeah. Maybe that's just me and like my chronic illness detector being like, <laughs> hey, look, it's another like like. You know, you I can smell, smell my your own. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. You can you can see the sunken sadness in her eyes. Yeah. In the years leading up to her death. Yeah. So, I don't know. That whole situation is weird. And then, but then the anemia factor is what really maybe. You... Yeah, I mean, like it's anemia is definitely more common in women, specifically women of menstruating ages. Yeah. Menstruation attracts the bears. <laughs> but why? Her, how her husband ended up with the same situation is. Beyond me, and by, unless he was just so drugged to the gill, he was able to fight it off longer. Who knows? Or maybe he was home self-medicating, but it was like just like a good old-fashioned bleeding or leeches. Or ghost did it. Ghost stole his or iron. Ghost, ghost, ghost stole my iron. <laughs> the ghost. I thought ghost didn't like iron. So confusing. They don't like cold iron. They're okay with hemoglobic iron. Okay. I guess. Um. I. Unrelated but related, I recently found out that George Washington's death was because he got a little, what was looking back, probably a cold. And over the course of like three days, his team of doctors drained him of over 40% of his blood. <laughs> That's how George Washington died. So they got the ghost out of his blood, though, right? Yeah. And then they did some <laughs> cocaine about it. All right. Did you... I know there was some last-second consternation about this. Did you come up with a nope, a celebrity nope, trick? Nope. People at home can't say I'm just covering my face. <laughs> no, I do not have a drink. I was tossing around some ideas. Now, I wouldn't want to use your, your sausage Bloody Mary, but could we have a Simon Monjack hemoglobic iron pack Bloody Mary? <laughs> Is there, how much, what's the iron contact of beef broth? I've been wanting to make Bloody Mary mix with beef broth. I don't know. I could use bone broth, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I was like, you had mentioned Britney Spears to me just very briefly, and I was like, I sh maybe, is he still doing Britney Spears? I could do a Britney Spears drink. I fucking love Britney Spears. It's Britney Spears. It's pretty bitch. Toxic drink. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, breaky slave for you? Yeah, I don't. I didn't fully come to fruition here with a drink. That's right. We can talk it out. I have some drinks I was thinking of, but they didn't really play into my plans. So I was like, hmm, charred pineapple. That has nothing to do with Joan Rivers. You can make a sunscreen at Colada out of charred pineapple. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> um, just could drink the sunscreen like uh, yeah, Charlie. That's right. We could do the South Beach diet. I mean, honestly, if we're doing some California beaches thing, I feel like I could use some charred pineapple and maybe some, like, 
sweet ginger vodka. I feel like there's a there's a like sweet, smoky, caramely, maybe a little spicy martini here. Okay. That wouldn't be beaches in West Hollywood, so we will have to call it something. But I feel like you could see beach. I just like LA is much more tropical and low key than New York. Burnt pineapple star fucker. That just sounds like a weird porn. <laughs> it can be a Hollywood Hills tropical martini. Why you gotta ruin my plan? Well, I don't know. We were talking beachy stuff, so that's why I was. It could be Hollywood Hills burnt pineapple. You fucked up my cabbage patch. Sorry. You done fucked up my cabbage patch. <laughs> How did I do that? We can go back from where I've, I've gone. We don't have to be here. We can go back. Uh... Girl from the ring, yes. So are you doing charred pineapple? You say ginger vodka? I'm thinking so. I mean, I haven't, I haven't made this, like, thing yet, but it could be, like... West Hollywood Blonde. That could work. <laughs> if I was doing whiskey, whiskey at go goes in West Hollywood, that would be helpful. But I'm not doing whiskey. Yeah. Vodka at go-go? It's Britney, bitch. <laughs> Can't we just call the drink it's Britney, bitch, no matter what I make? I suppose, but at least give people an idea what it's going to be if we're going to do burnt pineapple and ginger vodka. Charred. Charred. Not burnt. Charred pineapple. It's awful hard to burn a pineapple, I guess. Maybe not from the outside. I can, I can burn anything. <laughs> I don't. Doubt I mean that. that from a from a pyro standpoint, <laughs> less what, than a cooking standpoint. It. Yeah, that's okay. I just want to make sure, like, I the audience cook. may not the audience may not understand. The your, audience your should gift know with that I am, I am a I am a fire sign, <laughs> not a bad cook. Is what we meant by that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm thinking some charred pineapple, maybe some pineapple juice. Maybe yeah. juice from the charred pineapple. Crater Lake makes this a uh, great sweet ginger vodka mm -hmm. that I like to drink when the weather's nice anyway. So I need to go pick some of that up because we've had nice weather. Is that, is that going to get too sweet? Do we need to bring that down a little? or? No, no. Okay. I mean, this will not be my normal go-to level of sweetness, but it will not be you can only drink this if you drink the sweetest of sweet drinks. Drink. Copy. Drinks! Because I'm going to put a little spice in it, a little acid. And then I'm thinking maybe for some complexity of flavor, maybe we'll need to like use some hibiscus or something. It's hibiscus, bitch. <laughs> but yeah, no, I feel like maybe maybe this will be like a pineapple ginger martini with a hibiscus float. This might be terrible. <laughs> this is either going to be really good or really bad, but... Our recording is awful late into our uh, cycle for the amount of time you have to get this drink together, so it may end up <laughs> worse than some of the other efforts. <laughs> um, so it may just end up being a rum and coke okay. that we call Hollywood Blonde. It'll have, like, <laughs> powdered sugar around the rim. <laughs> it'll be. Oh my gosh. It'll, it'll start as a rum and coke, but with the right surgery, we can turn it into a... Uh, I don't think Hollywood starlets are really drinking rum and cokes. I think we're we're vodka sodaing it there. Probably. So it'll be vodka soda with a line of cocaine. Yeah. And then you chase it with just like one syringe of Juvederm. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll work on this uh, pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. Ginger pineapple, pineapple ginger. The hibiscus is where I'm like, maybe there's something else better here, but... But a, a tried and tested recipe will make it up on the uh, yeah. website eventually. Like I told you, I drink all of the drinks for you people. That's right. Not not just because she's a wash. Not just because I'm Irish, <laughs> Scottish, and a bartender. <laughs> Self-medicating. I also quality control. <laughs> is there anything else we need to cover or should we talk about what we want to do next episode um i think i don't have anything do you have an idea for the next episode well when we were talking about what to do this episode you brought up arbor day and the next episode will actually release on arbor day so that's a possibility also the next episode will be the last one before mother's day so that's a option you can look at we could just have mom for an episode just rambling about oh yeah uh, i'm, I'm like, all for spankytopia but we gotta well i just i mean like we don't even have to be there we can just give her some drinks and tell her to talk about like earth spirits that would probably cover it pretty well then you i won't... mean we might have to that might have to be like a two to three part series <laughs> 
Spankuses. <laughs> if we can talk her into that, I'm all for it. Yeah. Maybe give people a, some insight on where we come from about all our foibles. We're actually, we're actually very well adjusted considering where we came from. <laughs> right? You're all lucky our names aren't things like Rainbow and Mountain Air. Bolt Grinder. Well, your oldest child's real name is Bolt Grinder. We just don't talk about it in public. We don't want to make them uncomfortable. Sandy calls him Bolt Grinder all the time. I know. <laughs> Uncle Sandy can't keep things on the DL. <laughs> God, I hope that man wears a pith helmet every day of his life. <laughs> he, uh, Kel kind of just like mentioned offhand and invited him over to Jim's to watch the uh, NCAA finals and he showed up. <laughs> Did he have a fancy outfit for it? No. I just feel like Sandy should be a man about town in different outfits for different occasions. But I did discuss with him the uh, camel episode about the Beale Wagon Road and the U.S. Camel Court. He was pretty excited to hear that we were talking about that. For those of you who have no idea who Sandy is, Sandy is one of our older male theater friends who is about five foot tall in heels, <laughs> looks a little like a chipmunk. I want him to wear a pith helmet all the time. Because he's got the build and the mustache for it. Yeah. <laughs> I played his trophy wife in a short theater competition once. Had a lot of things hidden in my cleavage for that. All right, so tentative plan. I guess we'll try to bring Mom into the picture. Uh, otherwise, I guess we can ramble about her spirits on our own. Yep. Or we can just have Mom and Rowan talk about fairies. <sighs> could, we, could we please? <clears throat> what everyone wants, right? Derping so hard right now. <laughs> Well, I mean, and that, like, is going to make life easy because if we're doing anything environmentally related, I got drink ideas for that. Okay. Captain Planet. He's our hero, gonna bring pollution down to zero. That being said, uh, thanks for putting up with us yet again. <laughs> Be sure to check out our show notes. That's where we will have uh, links to all of the things. We'll have links to our socials and... Other places you can find us. We'll have links to Patreon and Tee Public and the other ways that you can help support us. I'll have links to uh, Alex Matsuo's article. From there, you're on your own because I was digging through tons of articles to find out what I could on that situation. Uh, always drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost! Next ghost! Next ghost! Dog is very upset now that I can't say that I blame him. Berserker! What would make the fuck berserker?